subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello and welcome. I'm Frank Edu Asare. And as usual, I'll lead in our history discussions on the Joy Learning Hour. Call me Wolof. Today's discussion is, is pretty interesting. We are going to be looking at one of Africa's foremost civilizations. The point I'm making is that we are going to look again at Africa's foremost civilizations, debunking any, any, any school of thought trying to suggest that Africans have never been part of world's civilization. But before we go ahead, as we do it always, let's go ahead. History time, African history time. History time, my history time. So let's kick start. Today's topic is civilization of Pharaonic Egypt from 3000 BC. This is Africa's foremost civilization. And it's not only about the academics, it is also to give us a sense of reliance and a sense of pride that as Africans, we have once upon a time led the civilization, which actually had influence in other parts of the world. So with all joy, let's begin. So civilization of Pharaonic Egypt from 3000 BC. The civilization of ancient Egypt was one of the world's oldest civilizations as old as those of Babylonia which is modern Iraq and that of the Indus Valley modern India as a matter of fact if you visit India there are so many of their civilizations in terms of architecture that when you see you marvel but the Egyptian civilization was older than those of the Incas and Aztecs and Aztecs we are talking about southern America. Are you able to give me any country from South America? Yes, you should. We are talking about Brazil. We are talking about Argentina, Venezuela. And then that of the Maya in Central America. Are you also able to tell me some countries from Central America? Yes, you should. In fact, as a student of history, you should be current. And so these things you should know. Central America, a country like Guatemala should come to mind. So look out for these countries. It is important to note that the Egyptian civilization was essentially an African civilization. I just want to stress on that. It was essentially an African civilization. And for that matter, it was your civilization and it was my civilization, essentially. It dates as far back as the period before 3400 BC. The Egyptian civilization attained a high level technological development and was also the first kingdom in the ancient world to attain political unity. And that it was in Egypt that Europe received the first elements of civilized life. So then who told you that Africa has never been at the forefront of world civilization? Indeed, we are the cradle of civilization. Now let's look at the emergence of kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt. Let's quickly go back to our previous lesson. I mean, if you remember, of which I know you do, we looked at a prehistoric period of Africa and we said at the very last stage, that was when a man had gotten to the highest level of his, of his development. And that was a stone, late stone age one. Here, man had begun to develop um, societies, communities from villages and, and, and things like that. So here it is going to play out. The civilization of Pharaonic Egypt, like all known civilizations of the world, adopted agriculture as a way of life. In fact, we keep on saying that the backbone of African economy is still agriculture. Why? Because we have vast lands, fertile lands, we have water bodies which we can maximize its use for the good of the people. So as students of history, as we move on in a higher echelon, we should begin to think that it's not bad to venture into agriculture. From 4,400 4, BC, the late Stone Age hunter and gatherers established village communities and domesticated 
plants and animals like wheat, barley, sheep, goats to serve as source of food. By 3400 BC, small farming communities had grown up in the Nile Valley. The communities were mainly Fayum, and I know you remember Fayum when we were doing prehistoric period. So it was one of the early farming villages that um, came up from the late Stone Age man. So Fayum, Marindi, Badari, and Nakada, they cultivated wheat, barley, and livestock. They also made pottery for cooking and for storing water. They were engaged in external trade as well. Evidence of this is the discovery of copper and cedar wood, which possibly might have come from Palestinia and Syria. After 3400 BC, the village or villages had grown into towns. The villages that early Stone Age man had established had grown into towns, and some of them appear to have been fortified. The houses in the towns were rectangular in shape and were built of mud bricks. This tells you again how civilized man was becoming, and particularly with Africans during the ancient Egyptian times that were burning um, bricks for building. Around 3100 BC, the towns were united into two main kingdoms, namely Lower and Upper Egypt. The Lower Egypt extended from the shores of the Mediterranean to the apex of the Nile Delta. The Upper Egypt stretched from the apex of the Nile Delta to Aswan, and Aswan is an ancient city of the Nile. Formerly, Upper and Lower Egypt were ruled as separate states, but later they became unified under Nama. So here we are talking of Pharaoh Nama, a ruler of Upper Egypt. Egypt then became the first ancient world to establish a centralized monarchical state. It is important we, we stress on that. Egypt became the first country in the ancient world to establish a centralized monarchical state. And so it throws further light on how civilized the African had been. And so anybody, any school of thought that tries to downplay the African by saying that we have never been part of world civilization, totally it is false. So then we again say that the first person or the first ruler to have unified Upper and Lower Egypt was Nama. Take note of that. Social and political organization of Egypt. So as Egypt was growing and was developing, it had social and political institutions. Let's go into it and look at them. The social structure of Egypt was made up of several distinct classes. And I know even in present day Ghana, we have social um, structure. We have um, the various classes. So we say we have the upper class, we have the middle class, and we have the lower class. Then in Egypt, they also had. So here they had the priests, they had the farmers, slaves, artisans, traders, and professional men, such as scribes, physicians, of which they formed a separate class. The wealthy persons formed the aristocratic group, that's the ruling class. And even today we see the upper class is made up of the aristocrats, and a lot of times they are in the helm of affairs. At the top of the socio-political structure was the pharaoh. He was divine. He claimed to be the earthly incarnation of their gods. So here we are looking at the characteristics of who the pharaoh was. He was regarded not as the mortal being, but God in the eyes of man. So he played the intermediary role between the living and the dead. As God kings, they were the intermediary between the spiritual world and their subjects. And same can be said of our chiefs today. That our chiefs are seen as playing a role of an intermediary between the living and the dead. Temples were erected for the Pharaoh and offerings were made to his sacred majesty. 
he had many duties and we have to look at some of the functions or duties of the pharaoh and this it can easily come in your exams let's look at some functions or duties performed by the pharaoh he was the commander in chief of the army who protected the empire from enemies he was the commander in chief of the army who protected the empire from attacking enemies and i think same can be said of our today um, leadership so the president of our country is the commander in chief of the nation's army and so he played the same function he was a supreme landlord to whom rent was paid by the tenant farmers we are looking at the duties that the, the, the pharaohs um, played at the time he was the chief judge who ensured justice for all he was the high priest who performed sacred religion and symbolic rituals five he was the chief admin administrator who ensured that the empire was effectively and effectively governed he was the symbolic father of the land who made sure his citizens had adequate food supply and again that seems to be the functions of our chiefs even up to today these are the roles that they play they are the father figures um, in our various communities and so they are revered next powerful person to the pharaoh was the vizier a sort of prime minister so we are looking at the socio-political structure of ancient egypt and at the top of this was the pharaoh and we've looked at the functions or duties of the pharaoh next to the pharaoh they had the vizier so it tells you that clearly the egyptians were civilized and we said that the civilization of ancient egypt was essentially an african civilization so about 99 percent of course because they were not an island there were influences and so they might have copied one or two from other places so we we'll get to know but what is important for us as students of african history is to note that the egyptian civilization was essentially our civilization and so we should be proud of that so after the pharaoh or beneath the pharaoh was the vizier whom we describe as a sort of prime minister almost every branch of state administration came under his control he tried cases had appeals and appointed magistrates he sent messengers to all parts of the country to deliver the pharaoh's orders to local officials in the 38 political districts of ancient egypt may i know how many constituencies do we have in ghana you should know tell the person you're watching this program with the number of constituencies we have in ghana yes i know you know 275 ah sounds good at the head of each political district was the governor so i mean just look at it the ancient egyptians had designed a very sophisticated political structure they had a pharaoh they had a vizier who is the prime minister and then they now have the governor so the various districts had their leadership and what was the objective the objective was to ensure efficient and effective administration at the head of each political district was the governor who was responsible for treasury the generals engineers and scribes he also levied taxes administered justice and maintained an armed force all in the name of the pharaoh so just as we have today we have our districts we have the municipalities they all act on behalf of the president and so they ensure that there is effective administration at their level of governance scribes were administrators trained from their youth for the task of government they kept accounts and copied documents there were civilians as well as military scribes ancient egypt was thus governed by a complex system of governance just as we have we have seen it was a highly civilized state governed by a divine king with assistance of a large body of officials appointed by him so in summary we will say that at the, at the apex of the sophisticated administrative structure developed by the ancient egyptians who were africans at the top was the pharaoh beneath him 
was the vizier, then you had the various administrators, then you had the governor. And as we said, the objective was to ensure that there was effective and efficient administration. And that is a credit to African civilization. The system of divine kinship later spread through Africa. But before we move on, let me ask this. What is the capital city of Egypt? I mean, as we look today. Uh-huh. Okay, so the capital city of Egypt today is Cairo. It's Cairo. Now let's look at development of high-level technology. So we are going to look at the features that characterize the Egyptian civilization. And one of them, as we are going to look at, is high-level technology. High-level technology in terms of irrigation. So back in 3400 BC, the ancient African Egyptians were looking at irrigation, then we have no cause to complain that if today we do not have effective and efficient irrigation systems. So as students of history, as we move on, we should begin to think of this. Egypt is the Nile, and the Nile is Egypt. This is a popular scene which explains that Egypt is basically an agricultural society. Let me pause here and bring your attention to something that has happened. I told you, as students of history, you should be current. You should be listening to what is happening in the global space so that you appreciate our subject um, much better. Today, there's an issue with the Nile. And this issue has to do with Egypt, particularly with Ethiopia and then Sudan. So it tells you how essential the Nile River still play in the lives of Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan, but particular reference to Egypt. So as we say, Egypt is a Nile and the Nile is Egypt, meaning Egypt totally depends on the Nile. So today there is an issue, and I want you to find out what is happening with the Nile today between um, Ethiopia and Egypt. And we are talking about the Renaissance Dam uh, being constructed by the Ethiopians. So Egyptian agriculture depended solely on the waters of the Nile which flowed from the Ethiopian highlands, flooded the banks of the river in July, and deposited abundant silt behind, which made the land ready for cultivation between November and May. Egypt, however, had a greater part of its land to be a desert. The cultivable areas of ancient Egypt were limited to the Nile Valley with an average width of about 16 kilometers. Intensive cultivation of this narrow strip of land required a regular and adequate supply of water from the Nile. So again, probably this might again be playing um, between the Ethiopians and the Egyptians. And the Ethiopians are also saying that they need a dam to construct a dam on the Nile for their socio-economic development. So let's look at what is happening. So be current, my friends, and listen to what is happening in a global space. The Egyptian farmers used oxen to plow the land and cultivate crops like wheat, barley, vegetables, flax cotton, and olive trees. As the crops grew, a regular supply of water became necessary. Initially, water was fetched by hand from the lower river and poured into specifically dark canals, which carried it to all parts of the farmland. And this would have been a tedious job, fetching water from the Nile and then you know, pouring it into a canal and onto the farmland. This might have been a very difficult task. Raising water from the lower river by hand make the work of the farmer tedious. As a solution, the farmers invented a simple machine to facilitate the work of the farmer. This machine was known as a shaduf. The shaduf consisted of a bucket and a pole provided with a pivot. So as relevant as history is, today we still have challenges um, with a lot of our areas um, requiring water to irrigate their farmlands. And there's a problem. So irrigation facilities are pretty important. And so from 3400 BC, if African civilization made provision for irrigational facilities, then we have no excuse today. So Shaduf was designed and developed by ancient Egyptians. And that is 
one of the mark of their civilizations for irrigational purposes. The bucket hung from one end of the pole while the other end carried a balancing weight. The pole rested on a pivot on a wooded crossbar from the ground. Raising the balancing weights on the pivot lowered the bucket into the river to be filled. Have you ever fetched water from a well before? Okay. Lowering the balancing weight raised a bucket full of water out of the river or well to be tipped into a canal for distribution to all parts of the farmland. The use of the shadow for irrigation enabled the ancient Egyptian farmers to cultivate large areas of land. So, they, so Shaduf made farming interesting. Shaduf made farming easy. And so a lot more people went into farming and they had a lot more of produce. On your screen is an example of the Shaduf. So you see a farmer using the Shaduf to fetch water and then to irrigate his farmland. This is the Shaduf. Great. Development of high-level meta technology. So after development of high-level irrigational facility, which was called a Shaduf, we are looking at shipbuilding. So wherever you come across and you are looking at the features of the Egyptian civilization, then these are the things that we have to discuss. Pharaonic Egypt possessed numerous blacksmiths, carpenters, stone cutters, weavers, porters, glass blowers, and workers in ivory, silver, and gold. Bear in mind, we are again looking at a civilization that was essentially an African civilization. So all these artisans were Africans. Between 1730 and 1570 BC, Egyptian craftsmen were introduced to bronze metallurgy by the Hyksos, an Asiatic people. Some sources say that they originated from Levant, and when you say Levant, we are looking at Syria and Lebanon. So within this enclave, the high source introduced um, to the Egyptians bronze metallurgy. I said earlier that the Egyptian civilization was essentially an African civil civilization. But of course, because Egypt was not an island, they made use of um, other technologies that they had borrowed as a result of contact with other people. And one of such was the high source. And we are saying that the high source were an Asiatic people, and sources claim that they originated from Levant. And I have explained what Levant means as the enclave, an area where you could find Syria and Lebanon. So the Hyksos invaded Egypt at a time when Egypt experienced a period of social disorder and disintegration. And this is key. Anytime there's no unity, anytime there's no peace, anytime there's disintegration, Anytime there's social disorder, this is what is bound to happen. Before you realize there's an invasion. And so it's almost essential that as a group of people or as a nation, we keep our heads together in unity for a common purpose. A fine dagger with an iron blade has been discovered from the grave of Pharaoh Tutankhamun. And this was between 1335 to 1326 BC. That was his reign, period of reign. Iron technology spread in Egypt from the invasion of the country by Assyria, home to modern day Iraq, Kuwait, and Syria. Now, let me again hit on this. We said the Egyptian civilization was an African civilization, but of course made use of other um, civilization that they borrowed from elsewhere. And two groups of people that have come up who actually influenced the Egyptian civilization as well, were the Hyksos and the Assyrians. What you have to note here is who introduced the Egyptians to bronze metallurgy and again who introduced the Egyptians to iron technology. We have to note and know the difference. The Hyksos introduced the Egyptians to bronze metallurgy while the Assyrians also introduced the Egyptians to iron technology. The victory of the Assyrians demonstrated clearly to the Egyptians the superiority of iron weapons to bronze. The Egyptians, having realized the superiority of iron weapons to bronze, started to develop iron technology. 
So it's not bad at all to, is it to copy? It's not bad at all to, to take from um, something good from the other side of the coin. It is not bad at all. If you find it worthy, why not grab it and make use of it? Shipbuilding became popular from this time on out of wood, papyrus, and iron. Egypt developed trade relations with countries like Cyprus, Syria, and Lebanon, and areas south of the Red Sea. Some of the ships they built measured up to 30 meters in length and were capable of carrying 80 tons of cargo. Development of engineering technology. Development of engineering technology. From what we've looked at so far, we've looked at irrigation, um, which the Egyptians had developed the shaduf. We've also looked at the introduction of bronze and iron metallurgy, which had influenced the Egyptians in their weaponry and also in the building of ships. Now let's look at pyramids. And I know the moment Egypt is mentioned, it's one of the things that people associate Egypt with. Pyramids. Pyramids. Yes, it is true. So let's look at the pyramids in Egypt. The most outstanding achievement of Pharaonic Egypt in engineering was the building of the pyramids. The pyramids were huge tombs constructed to serve as royal burial places for the pharaohs. It must be noted that the early kings of Egypt were buried in masterpieces. It was a rectangular structure above ground with sloping sides and a flat top. The construction of the first pyramid is credited to Pharaoh Zosa. So you take note, the first pyramid to have ever been constructed in, in Egypt was by Pharaoh Zosa. And this was somewhere 2700 BC. The vizier Inhotep and Sinifero also constructed dias in the 2600 BC. And I know you remember what the vizier means. The greatest of all was the one built by Pharaoh Khufu at Giza, opposite Cairo, around 2600 BC. And of course, Fa uh, Cairo is the capital city of Egypt. And we are saying that the greatest of all the pyramids ever built was by Pharaoh Khufu. And this was around 2600 BC. And it was built at Giza, opposite Cairo. This pyramid, one of the greatest in the world, stands at 140 meters high and measures 222 meters square at the base. It is estimated that the pyramid contains 250 million blocks carefully put together without mortar. And I tell you, to today, archaeologists are at this, uh, on site around the pyramids trying to find the, the science behind the construction of the pyramids. And I mean archaeologists from all over the world. And this construction was a masterpiece of the African. It took 120,000 workers 30 years to complete it. This great edifice is counted among the great wonders of the world. It clearly shows the high engineering technology developed by ancient Egyptians. So when you talk about Egypt, then you talk about pyramids, and they have a number of them wonderfully built. And we said that the greatest of all was the one built by Pharaoh Khufu, and this was around 2600 BC. It was constructed by 120,000 workers, so it tells you it was a huge project. On your screens, you see the pyramid at Giza. This is a short of the pyramid at Giza. And I tell you to today, we still have um, archeologists all over the place trying to understand the science behind um, the construction of the pyramids. Again, you see a picture of Pharaoh Khufu, the young man Pharaoh Khufu, who was endowed with wisdom. I mean, if you really want to confirm, look at the nose, I mean, the features. It tells you clearly that Pharaoh Khufu was one of our kind as an African. And as I end this, I tell you that, again, there has been several schools of thought trying to shift the African presence in the Egyptian civilization by saying um, the Egyptian civilization was 
more or less a Mesopotamian civil no it is not true it was essentially our civilization and we have to be proud of that development of religion art and architecture so again we are looking at the characteristics of the Egyptian civilization what is it that makes Egyptian civilization worthy to be studied and this is what we are looking at Egyptian religion was essentially nature worship the Sun became an object of particular adoration so nature worship means the people worship things created by God things in nature things on the environment because they they saw it as a masterpiece of God it was therefore represented by several deities they included Amon Re and this um, God's looking at take note of them because it has come in, um, in in the exams before so you have the gods and then what they represent so you have Amon Re and it's the sun god Horus the god of the rising sun Osiris god of the dead Isis or oh, let me let me say it again Isis but the moment I say Isis it is not that Isis this is goddess of life goddess of life we have Seth, god of evil i did not say seth like somebody's name i said Seth. this is god of evil so that we don't begin to call people by i mean with the name seth as god of evil no it's set s-e-t mat goddess of justice so you can have it so easy in your exams you have the gods and what they represent Animals also played an important religious role in the religious lives of the Egyptians. So animals like jackal, bull, ram, hawk, crocodile, and snakes were highly respected because they were thought to be symbols of various gods. And now let's pause for a moment and look at something. When we're looking at the ethnic groups in Ghana, I mean the people in Ghana, we say, I mean there were several schools of thought which tried to explain that Akans might have originated from Egypt to Ethiopia to Nigeria and here. Now, if you look carefully at the social structure of the Akans, especially the, uh, the clans, you find that the clans also have some animals as representatives. So do we see some semblance? Yes, maybe. Maybe they, they originated from there. So, example, the god Horus, the son of Isis, was pictured as a hawk. A remarkable feature of Egyptian religion was the development of the belief in one god, monotheism. Though they were nature worship, there was an attempt to develop the worship of one god. Who might have introduced this idea? We'll get to know. So that is monotheism. Pharaoh Akhenaten, who ruled about... 1375 BC ordered the Egyptians to worship only Aten. Pharaoh Akhenaten, who ruled around 1375 BC, ordered the Egyptians to worship only Aten, the sun god. So, Pharaoh Akhenaten, you take note of that also. Pharaoh Akhenaten introduced the worship of one god, which is monotheism, to the Egyptians. And the god that he introduced was Aten, and that is the sun god the creator and ruler of the world after the death of Akhenaten the worship of nature was reintroduced in your shot is an image of Pharaoh Akhenaten Pharaoh Akhenaten again if you really want to appreciate what we mean by saying the Egyptian civilization was essentially our civilization but not Mesopotamian or Greek civilizations again look at the features the nose and the eyes and all of that it clearly represents ours and so the Egyptian civilization was an African civilization the Egyptians had a belief that man has a soul which survives the death of the body so life after death that is life after death for this reason the dead bodies of the rich were embalmed and wrapped in fine linen and placed in a tomb for protection the tomb of the rich was always filled with personal possessions and offerings of food and drinks and again let's go back to the i mean to the to the Ghanaian society and look at how we bury 
um, our departed souls. These things are also present in our funeral rites. So again, then there might be some, I mean, those who um, espouse that school of thought that accounts or Ghanaians, but specifically accounts might have originated from Egypt, might have some, some points in there because we do this um, here as well. These were called Egyptian mummies. So the embalmed bodies were called Egyptian mummies. The pyramids were built to protect the bodies of kings and provide them with a comfortable home after their immortal soul. So the pyramids served as a place to keep the bodies of the pharaohs, or say the kings. And it was to protect the bodies of kings and provide them with a comfortable home after their immortal soul, which they call Ka or Ba. The Egyptian arts and craftsmanship served a dual purpose, religious and religious, religious and non-religious. We are saying that the Egyptian arts and craftsmanship served a dual purpose, and that was religious and non-religious. The tombs of the pharaohs were filled with jewelry, pottery, and gold. And I think we can say same of our departed souls, especially our chiefs and kings. The walls of some of these tombs had paintings with scenes of everyday life, such as plowing, harvesting, hunting, feasting, and the work of scribes and craftsmen. Fortunately, on your shot, you will see in the tomb on the walls some of these drawings or some of these paintings. You see the day-to-day -day life of the Egyptians beautifully decorated on the walls of the tombs. And again, this was the handiwork of the ancient Egyptians who were true and true Africans. Statues carved of wood, limestone and bronze appear to be realistic portraits of important officials, individuals or animals. They produce the high four-sided stone pillars called obelisk. An obelisk was a four high, high rising structure like a skyscraper which was used for religious purposes and also served as notices board. They also carved statues for the body of a lion and the head of a man or ram. These were the famous sphinxes, considered as one of the wonders of the world. So Egyptian civilization has a lot which have been um, penned down as wonders of the world. We earlier looked at the pyramids, especially the one built at Giza, opposite Cairo. Now we are looking at the sphinx, the sphinx. So on your screens, you see the sphinx. The Sphinx, I mean, it beats imagination. And this is way back into the centuries. And it was the handiwork of the ancient Egyptians. The Egyptian architectural dexterity was clearly found in their rectangular shaped buildings built with mud bricks with wall in between them. So the, the architecture, skillfully, they had beautiful architectural styles and they are their communities were well laid out with roads and, and they needed um, social amenities. So they had rectangular shape buildings and this was an impressive work. Impressive also was the construction of the canal built to connect the Nile with the Red Sea. And this was 4,000 years ago. An impressive work to build a canal to connect the Nile with the Red Sea. And just um, on the other side of the canal, you are going to the Southern Arabia, particularly Yemen, and the rest. Development of the art of writing. Again, we are looking at the features that characterizes the Egyptian civilization. So the moment you mention Egyptian civilization, what are the things that goes into it to really give it um, this light that it has received over the years and years? We've looked at irrigation, um, systems we've looked at engineering and now we are looking at the art of writing art of writing another remarkable achievement of Egyptian civilization was the development of the art of writing which dates back to 3000 BC the earliest form of writing was a hieroglyphics so you take note of that also hieroglyphics 
it consisted of sacred characters inscribed on stone slabs. It was used to record the victories and achievements of the pharaohs. So you take note of the first um, form of writing that developed from ancient Egypt and what it was used for. We have said that the first or the earliest form of writing was the hieroglyphics. And it was used to record the victories and achievements of the early pharaohs. So if you come across it, um, outline the various forms of writing that evolved from Egypt and what they were used for, you should be able to do this easily. The second form of writing was the hieratic. It was a form of shorthand used by the priest. So here we know what it also means. The second one was a hieratic and it was a form of writing or it was a shorthand used by the priest. Have you been to the hospital and you, you find a way um, the doctors write? It's shorthand. And it was this one we are looking at. The hieratic was purposely used by the priest. The third form was demotic. Demotic. It was a much faster cursive um, form of writing. It's a running script. It was developed shortly before 600 BC. But then importantly on your, on your shot, we have some pictures to demonstrate um, these forms of writing. So on your shot right now is the hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphic. This is how um, it looked like. Then again, you have the hieratic also on your screen, the hieratic. So the three forms of writing, the hieroglyphics, the hieratic, and now the third one is the demotic. Is the demotic. Which one was the cursive type? The simple question. All right, the demotic. It was the Egyptians who created the earliest alphabet, A, B, C, D, up to Z. That formed the elements of written language today. So why don't we give credit to, to African civilization? The, the, the Egyptians created the earliest alphabets that form the elements of written language today. Between 3000 and 2700 BC, they developed 24 definite signs, each of which represented a consonant sound. And this is by the Egyptians and was from the African continent. These signs form the earliest alphabet developed in ancient world. It is believed to have provided a model for the Phoenician alphabets ultimately transmitted to Greece. There the vowel sounds were added to produce the complete alphabet today. So we need to give credit to the Egyptian civilization, which was essentially an African civilization. The ancient Egyptians also invented materials, the papyrus, the papyrus reed, was used to manufacture a kind of paper while a pen of salt was made from reed. Signs in there by the ancient Egyptians. Water, gum, and carbon were mixed to produce ink. This enabled the Egyptians to record events and note down important national matters. Among the literary works produced by the Egyptians included historical novels, proverbs, love songs, annals, and religious works. Development of mathematical calculations. We've gotten to know clearly that A, B, C, D, the verbs and were all handy works of the African civilization. So development of mathematical calculation probably is also going to give us an insight into the impact that Egyptian civilization has had on mathematics to today. The Egyptians also invented a method of calculating rectangular areas. They became necessary because they wanted to construct canals, mark out boundaries of farmland, and measure sizes. The Greek transformed the rough rules of land measurement developed by the Egyptians into science of geometry. So the foundation of geometry actually evolved from Africa. And that is why we keep saying that it is, the continent is a cradle of civilization. Egyptian farmers also contributed to develop the decimal system through their use of the number 10 as a unit of calculation. 
The ancient Egyptian priests measured and recorded the movement of the sun, moon, stars, and the planets. In the process, they established a calendar of the 365 days around 2776 BC. This is loaded. And it is an African civilization. They also invented the water clock and sundial to measure time. These achievements provided a basis for the development of modern European civilization. And I think with a, with a sundial in Ghana, families can relate to it. That back in the day, they would put, they would put some water in the sun and they'll be able to tell you what the time was. And so we are saying that of all that the Africans or the Egyptian civilization had contributed, it served as the basis for the development of modern European civilization. Introduction of Islam and Christianity into Egypt. Introduction of Christianity and Islam into Egypt. But before we go on this, we have looked at some features that characterized Egyptian civilization. We've looked at mathematics, we've looked at engineering, we've looked at pyramids, we've looked at um, the shaduf, and we've looked at um, the forms of writing which Afri the ancient Egyptians had developed. And these are marked features of Egyptian civilization. So wherever you find it to, to discuss the fact or the features of the Egyptian civilization, these are some of the things that you should gladly write because it is your civilization. Introduction of Christianity and Islam into Egypt. I mean, today we look at Egypt and it's largely an Arabic country, even though they have about 10% Christians who are termed as Coptics. Let's look at how Christianity um, and Islam influenced Egypt. Ancient Egyptians were polytheists, and when we say polytheists, we are looking at the worship of more than one God. Attempt before I move on. So if it is polytheism and we have monotheism, we said that there was once upon a time a pharaoh who tried his possible best to introduce monotheism in Egypt. Do we recall the name? Yes. Attempt by Pharaoh Akhenaten, that is the name, Pharaoh Akhenaten, to introduce monotheism in the 14th century BC failed. That is, after his death, the Egyptians went back to nature worship. Before the end of the first century AD, Christianity had been introduced into Egypt from Palestine. During the next three centuries, Christian communities had grew up in Egypt, and during the reign of the Roman Emperor Constantine, the majority of Egyptians had become Christians. So around AD 305 to 335, majority of Egyptians were Christians, and Christianity had you know, entered Egypt through Palestine. After the death of Theodosius, the last emperor of the United Roman Empire, which occurred in AD 395, the Roman Empire was divided into the western and eastern parts. The western part was governed from Rome, while the eastern part was the Byzantine Empire, which ruled from Constantinople. And today, when you talk about Constantinople, Constantinople can be found in Turkey. And that's the largest city and former capital of Turkey. The Byzantine Empire comprised Asia Minor, that is Asia part of modern Turkey. And it is only Turkey that has part of its land in Asia and part of its land also in Europe. The Balkan Peninsula, which includes countries of Greece, Macedonia, Romania, Serbia, and European Turkey. As I said, part of Turkey is in Asia and part of Turkey is also in Egypt. The empire was Greek in culture and language and Christian in religion. By the 5th century AD, Egyptians had developed several grievances against the Byzantine rulers. First, the persecution of Christians by the emperors of the 3rd and 4th centuries had caused Egyptians to hate their foreign masters. Secondly, the Egyptians resented the imperial declaration of AD 381, which made Constantinople, rather than Alexandria, the second city in Christendom. Thirdly, Egypt did not like being treated as a mere province of the Byzantine Empire and a chief source of grain, supplies, and revenue. The Egyptians expressed their resentment in the following religious terms. First, they continued to maintain the monophysite doctrine, 
which taught that the human and divine elements in the person of Christ constituted a single nature, not two. So God the Father and God the Son, they looked at it as one. Other than the teachings of the Orthodox, um, I mean the teaching from the Orthodox end, which says that God and Father, the monophysite doctrine says that they are one, not separated. This was against the Orthodox teaching of the Catholic Church. Secondly, the Egyptians modified the Catholic form of Christianity to suit their own circumstances. Their version of Christianity became known as a Coptic Christianity. So when you go to Egypt, you ask of Coptic Christianity, that is their form of Christianity there. The Coptic Church of Egypt used the Egyptian language uh, Coptic for worship and translated the scriptures into dialects of Egypt. The Coptic Church held a view that achieving spiritual development could be attained through asceticism, self-denial, and self-discipline. The emphasis on asceticism gave birth to monastic ideas. The Egyptian desert became the home of the first monasteries in Christendom. From Egypt, the missionaries took the faith to Nubia. Nubia is today Sudan. In the 6th century AD, the three Nubian kingdoms were converted to Christianity and, re and remained Christian until the 14th century AD. The Christian church also grew up in Ethiopia under the protection of the Coptic church of Egypt from the 4th century AD. This explains the similarities between the doctrines and rites of the Ethiopian Alexandrian churches. By the 3rd and 4th centuries AD, there were more bishops in the Maghreb than France and Egypt combined. The Maghreb produced church fathers like St. Tertullian, St. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, and St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo. Islam followed Christianity into Africa in the 7th century AD. It originated in Arabia, which had been in continuous contact with Egypt for many centuries. At the time of the death of the Prophet Muhammad in 632 AD, you take note of that, the Middle East was divided into two rival empires, Byzantine or Byzantium and Persia. The followers of the Prophet who had launched a jihad in Arabia in 622 AD took advantage of the military weakness of the Byzantine Empire as well as the unpopularity of its government among the Coptic population of Egypt to invade Egypt in December 639 AD. The Byzantine fortress of Babylon, which was the capital of Byzantine province of Egypt, was captured. A treaty was signed making Egypt part of the new Arab. So by AD 639, Egypt had fallen under Islam. It also inaugurated Egyptian or guaranteed Egyptian Christians considerable freedom of worship. Under the Fatimid dynasty that ruled in the 10th and 11th century AD, industrial and commercial prosperity reached its peak. Plantation agriculture was developed, export was promoted, banking facilities were made available. Learning received a great boost and Arab achievement in medicine, mathematics and natural sciences were shared with Egypt. In 1517, Egypt became part of the Ottoman Empire that is the Turkish Empire, and remained so for some 400 years. So Egypt is a Nile, and the Nile is Egypt, as we saw earlier. What does that mean? What it means is that Egypt was basically an agricultural society. Agriculture was heavily dependent on the Nile, hence the saying, Egypt is the Nile, and the Nile is Egypt. The success of the agricultural activity depended on the Nile, since the land on both sides of the river was a desert. The greater part of the land was desert, therefore cultivable land was limited to the Nile Valley, which had an average width of about 16 kilometers, as we saw earlier. The benefits Egypt derived from the Nile could be looked at from the following perspectives. Fishing. So when we say Egypt is the Nile and the Nile is Egypt, then this is what we mean. Fishing. The Nile was used for fishing. Irrigation. Egyptians relied on the Nile for irrigation. Military, the Egyptians' navy used Nile Valley or the Nile River for defensive and offensive purposes. So they were very skillful on the Nile. 
when it came to war. Crop production. In July, the river now rose and flooded its banks as a result of the rains in the Ethiopian highlands. The flood waters carried silts, which we, we discussed earlier, and deposited in the Nile Valley to fertilize the soil for cultivation of crops. We are saying that uh, the Nile was so important in the life of Egyptians in a sense that it was used for domestic purposes. The Egyptians used the Nile for domestic purposes such as uh, drinking and washing. Transportation. The Egyptians relied on the Nile for all other imports and exports and traveled on it to neighboring towns. So when we say Egypt is the Nile and the Nile is Egypt, this is what we mean. Egypt totally depended on the Nile. In effect, we have come to a conclusion of a civilization that was essential in African civilization, the civilization that produced um, mind-blowing architectural um, styles, the civilization that created the alphabet, the civilization that created the forms of writing, the civilization that created a shadow for irrigation, is what we have looked at. But we can never go without looking at some assignment for you. So this is your home link. One, state the three forms of writing developed by the Egyptians and mention the use of the hieroglyphics. Two, mention three reasons why we say Egypt is a Nile and the Nile is Egypt. Third one, the greatest of all the pyramids in Egypt was built by who? Where in Egypt and around what year? The Egyptian civilization was essentially what? The use of the horse-drawn chariot was borrowed by the Egyptians from where? Six, mention five Egyptian deities and what they represent. Seven, Egyptian craftsmen were introduced to bronze metallurgy by... Eight, who was the vizier? Nine, the first country in the ancient world to establish a centralized monarchical state was... You put it there. And state for duties of the pharaoh. My friends, we've come to the end. And I'm so much sure that you have enjoyed one of Africa's foremost civilizations. And that is your civilization, my civilization. So let us develop the interest in our subject and read. Just read. When you read, you definitely get your A. So we've come to the end. As we sign off always, be well and be safe. covid is still present. Let's protect ourselves. You can also send me an email. Thank you. Bye-bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.